Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, for this special webinar entitled COVID-19, Back to Campus Planning, Health Promotion, Preparations in Diverse University Settings. My name is Elaine Ald, and as Sophie's Chief Executive Officer, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the special presentation on an extremely important and timely topic. We have an exciting panel from a very diverse range of academic institutions with me today to hopefully share their campus plans and help inform yours as we move forward. A few housekeeping details to get started. Um, I'd like to review you uh, just a few things. First, we're using the Zoom technology today and so all participants have the option to connect via audio or on using their computer speakers or the dial-in number. Um, our today's session is of course being recorded and will be available on the SOFI YouTube channel within a week, including the slides and other resources. Uh, due to our quick organization of today's webinar in just a, about 10 days, it is not approved for Category 1 CE hours, but you may wish to apply uh, this learning to your Category 2 for CHES or MCHES credits. And last but not least, we get to get an optimal recording. Uh, we've uh, muted all participants ex except our panelists. We'll reserve the time for questions until all four of our present presenters have the chance to uh, share their insights. Uh, but of course, we want to hear from you at any time by putting your questions in the Q&A box. Um, and we'll also have several polling questions, hopefully this afternoon, to encourage your response and find out a little bit more where you are in terms of your COVID planning. And at the conclusion of today's event, uh, please complete our brief feedback form so we can um, improve and uh, also address both your compliments and your suggestions in the near future. Since we've invited many uh, non-members to our SOFI uh, webinar today, I'd just like to briefly say a word or two about SOFI and its COVID-19 resources. We're founded in 1950 and now celebrating our 70th year, SOFI's mission is to promote leadership, global leadership to the profession of health education and health promotion and to promote the health of society. Our members comprise some 4,000 faculty, behavioral scientists, practitioners, and students working in colleges and universities, as well as community-based organizations, healthcare work sites, K-12 environments, and federal, state, and local public health agencies. We set standards for professional preparation and community and school health education. We conduct conferences as well as distance education programs like this, publish three peer-reviewed journals and newsletter, and support more than 20 chapters throughout the US and advocate on behalf of the profession, public health and health equity. Our faculty university community of practice is one of 14 special interest groups within SOFI and free to our members. So recognizing the, the pivot to distance education at the college and university level, one of the first COVID-19 resources we put out and I'd like to bring to your attention is this curated collection of articles from our journal, Pedagogy and Health Promotion, the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning. Whether you are a faculty member or an in-service instructor, you'll find valuable tips for online teaching and adjusting to distance education. And we've made this open to all non-SOFI members. Some of our additional COVID resources we put together, our journal Health Promotion Practice blog series uh, provides a variety of practitioner experiences uh, during COVID-19, and you can link to this off our SOFI website. Health Education and Behavior, our research journal, just published in the August 2020 issue, 19 uh, open access articles that are available to you um, on various range of uh, experiences in COVID and how it's affected vulnerable populations. Um, we've had a series of recorded webinars um, over the last several months and just uh, listing them here on uh, the impact on African American and vulnerable populations, Hispanics and Latinos, how COVID-19 has affected children and families, and a couple coming up uh, that are just one tomorrow on maternal child health and one next month on LBGTQ populations. So you can uh, access the recorded webinars through Sophie's Core and those coming up, you can register for off the SOFI calendar. We're also very proud of to co be co-sponsoring with the American College Health Association, 
um, the first ever virtual summit, COVID-19 planning for now and building for the future, which will be held on July 28th and 29th. So just next week from 12.30 to 4.30 every day. Uh, we invite you to join uh, ACHA and the industry experts and your college health colleagues to delve into many more uh, aspects of the uh, COVID-19 planning on campuses and uh, have some very valuable takeaways from that. Uh, National SOFI members are eligible for a registration discount. So now on to the context for today's event. We all know that COVID-19 pandemic has reshaped not only the way we go about our individual lives, but also the institutions of K through 12 and higher education. Over the last several months, college and universities across the country have had to quickly pivot to remote learning and are now faced with the challenges of how to move forward. This slide just released last week from the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation shows the current number of daily infections and the predicted fall scenario. Uh, the fall scenario is in gray uh, on your screen um, and it, it shows also the very large expected increase if mandates are eased as some parts of the country are now discussing. That is the line in red. And if the lower number of projected cases in green, um, here the line in green shows if universal masks are required. So obviously, like the rest of the economy, colleges and universities are, must balance the need to protect health and safety of their students and faculty, while also meeting the required mission of supporting students' learning. And you can see a lot of the variables that are in play just with this one slide. So our goal today is to bring you important information about what health promotion experts from both small and large and other diverse campus populations across the country are doing and hoping that this information can help you shape and address what might be implemented on your question, on your campus. And with that, we'll go to the first polling question. Diana, can you bring that up for us? So first of all, we'd like to learn a little bit more about those of you joined us today. Can you give us some uh, a response on the size of the student enrollment at your college and university. We recognize uh, that that one size certainly does, does not fit all. So if you have less than 5,000 students, uh, a range of five to 9,000 students on your campus, 10,000 in 1999, or 20,000 or more uh, students on your campus. You can submit your responses. Uh, to that polling question, and we'll find out what people are, what our audience looks like. Are you able to bring that up, Diana? Okay. So we have a very nice range here. Some folks, uh, really about 39% of you are from 9,000 students and less. And uh, the, the about half of you also, uh, the other half is really looking at anything 10 to 20,000 and more. Thank you for your responses. Let's go to one more polling question before we turn it over to our uh, distinguished features, speakers. So our second polling question is, what plans has your college or university announced for the fall 2020 semester? Uh, are all students going to be returning to campus for in-person classes with social distancing? Will be students uh, be taking hybrid classes, come into the classroom and for instruction and then some online learning, sort of the blended approach? Will all classes except labs be delivered by a distance education? or is your college or university still in the process of trying to determine uh, what its next step should be? So give me a minute just to decide uh, and respond to that question. Okay, Diana, if you can pull up those responses. So the vast majority here are clearly 76% are going to hybrid, the hybrid approach of having some classroom instruction and some online learning. A few are still undecided uh, and smaller numbers uh, are returning to campus for all in-person classes with social distancing. 
um, or all classes except the labs delivered by a distance education. So very, very helpful. Thank you for responding and sharing uh, what's happening on your campus. And we'll close that and I think jump to our third polling question. Uh, I mean, go to our, our, our next um, set of respondents uh, and get, get right into it. It's, it's my pleasure to, to introduce to you our, our first two expert panelists as we work from the west part of the country to the east. Our first speaker, Andrea Baker, hails from Concordia University in Seward, Nebraska. Andrea has been the Director of Student Wellness for the past seven years there, and prior to her position at Concordia, she worked at Bryan Health on the Medical Renal Unit. She received her Bachelor's of Science in Nursing from Bryan College of Health Sciences in 2009 and her Master's of Science in Nursing in 2013. She serves on numerous boards and task forces at the local, regional, and national level and has served as President of the Central College Health Association and is now helping to plan the American College Health Association annual conferences, including the one just met, mentioned. Moving from west to east, Andrea will be followed by Dr. Saranda Robinson, who is an epidemiologist, professor, and the chair of the Department of Public Health Education at North Carolina Central University in Durham, North Carolina. Dr. Robinson teaches courses on epidemiology, biostatistics, and group leadership, she advises the senior departmental majors in the design and contact and, and evaluation of field placement projects and conducts the evaluation of community-based interventions. She serves as a coordinator for NCCU's Eagle, Pride, Blood, Marrow, Organ, Sickle Cell, and Cord Blood Drive, and as the advisor of her Ada Sigma Gamma chapter, the Gamma Phi chapter. She received her bachelor's and master's degree in mathematics from Clark Atlanta University and a doctorate in epidemiology from the School of Public Health at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Welcome Ms. Baker and Dr. Robinson to our SOFI campus planning webinar. Take it away, Andrea. All right, um, so thank you so much for um, having me be part of this, this webinar. Um, this has definitely been an interesting time um, and a learning experience for all of us. So I hope whatever information shared today is helpful to all of you. Um, I'm from Concordia University. Uh, we are in Seward, Nebraska. Um, about, oh, I've been here about seven years, uh, kind of like Elaine said, and it has definitely been a year of some interesting changes. Um, but I've, I've learned a lot from, from this whole experience. So. Next slide, please. Okay, we'll go to the next one, too. So about 25 miles west, I don't know how many people are familiar with Lincoln, or, uh, Nebraska, but um, we are about 25 miles west of Lincoln, which is our capital city in Nebraska. We're a small school, about 1,200 undergraduate students, uh, mostly residential, um, so dorms um, or some off-campus housing within the city of Seward. We're about 50-50 between in-state and out-of-state students on our campus. And one very unique thing and special, special thing about our university is we are a Lutheran Church of the Missouri Senate affiliated university. So we, we have chapel daily and students have a lot of opportunities to, to learn and grow about their faith here. So this is a, a lovely slide of Nebraska. Um, our numbers, uh, this is actually posted every day on our state website. So you can see the total number of cases within the whole state. Um, I'm gonna talk about testing here in just a little bit, but um, you'll see those numbers. In our specific county though, we've only had 61 cases. Um, we are kind of in between some of the, the larger areas, obviously Lincoln being our capital city, but we also had some areas that popped up with some hot spots, um, kind of all around us, north, south, east, and west. So we're pretty fortunate that we've only had 61 cases. 51 people have recovered and we've only had, had one death. So we've been fairly fortunate in our little area um, as far as COVID goes. 
As far as being involved on campus, I am a member of our reopening task force. Uh, we started planning back end of April, first part of May to come up with plans to reopen the university. I'm also on our critical incident management team as a health center liaison. And I oversee our, our wellness center, which is our student health center and our counseling office as well. I also do the health education on campus for our students and I have student leaders to help me with that. So testing, um, being a small school and we don't have um, a lot of resources, I don't have a lot of space as well. I've been working to coordinate with our local hospital system, which is only two blocks away, which is very fortunate for our students. Even if they are unable to drive there, it's not that far away. So it's a, been a really great partnership for us. I also had a really good working relationship with our local health department and they've been part of the planning process when it comes to testing. So students will be able to go um, to our local hospital if um, they're symptomatic, if they're a close contact. We also have something that's called Test Nebraska, which is a free service and testing availability for anybody that lives within the state. It was done through the National Guard up until about a month ago. And then they picked local um, hospitals to kind of take over and do those, those testing um, locations. So we have a lot of options here, which is really, really been important to us. Um, it is, like I said, a coordinated effort between the, the hospital system and our local health department. We also have the option with having a strike team is what we're calling it. And if we would have an outbreak on campus, we could mobilize the strike team. The strike team could come to campus and test students if needed. Again, that'd be a, a coordinated effort between, between all of us. Um, right now, currently testing is, um, with Test Nebraska is only taking 48, 72 hours. Our other public lab is about five to seven days. So we're pretty fortunate on turnaround times at this moment, but also aware that, that things may change depending on the number of tests. That's our testing plan for right now. Could change. So contact tracing, um, can't do one without the other. So if you're having testing done um, or sending students for testing, you have to be able to contact trace as well. So because we are from a smaller region, um, I will be doing the on-campus contact tracing and we have developed a contact tracing team. So this is mostly um, comprised of our athletic trainers and through our student life office. They will complete the John Hopkins training course for contact tracing and they will assist me with contact tracing if it becomes overwhelming for me. But we will be only contact tracing for our students. Um, if through this process, it's determined that they were, you know, the students were in the, the community, they were working, um, or there's additional people to be notified, our local health department will do that. Um, because I'm limited on what I can do, I, it's really important to me and to the health department that they're able to communicate with those individuals and they can do additional uh, screenings and give guidance as needed. When we find out we have a positive test result, um, we already had a communicable disease plan in place and so I followed along with what we've done in the past. And as far as communication goes, I, I report to my direct supervisor that we had a positive case on campus. And that is really all the information that I share with them. Um, tell them when they were on campus last and what buildings they were in. Pretty, pretty basic. I don't share any personal information with anyone else on campus. Once we have students on campus, though, there will have to be, you know, communication with our student life office because that's where our housing um, and um, student development is. So we'll need to make sure we're communicating with them. But we will not be sharing names with other individuals on campus of those that are positive. For us, we decided to use the Campus Clear app for symptom reporting, and this is for all students, faculty, and staff. Um, one of the reasons we liked it is it's free, um, but it also has a really comprehensive dashboard 
that we can use and it's much easier for me to track those that are reporting symptoms and then I can notify them um, or get into communication with them and make sure they're getting the help that they need. If they don't have a smartphone, there is the ability to have a, a push notification um, go to their emails so they can still respond to those. Right now we're just planning to have symptoms be tracked Monday through Friday, but that could expand if needed um, to Saturday and Sunday. But it's an option that we're looking into. So that's one way we're gonna have um, an ability to kind of track symptoms and get in connection with students that they are reporting that they're having any COVID-19 symptoms. With quarantine and isolation, right now, um, the plan is that if a student, you know, has come to me and we identify that they need to have some testing done, we will go ahead and refer them on for testing, but we ask that they self-isolate for test results. We do have space on campus um, if students need to stay here to self-isolate or they can, you know, go to their off-campus residence or to their home. Criteria to return to campus, um, they have to be fever free for three days. We're doing and using the CDC guidance, um, improvement in their respiratory symptoms if they have any, and that it's been 10 days since their symptoms began. I'm going to be serving more as that case management, um, just checking and making sure that they have everything they need. Um, if they are having symptoms, connecting them to an off-campus provider, we are a small health center. Currently, it's myself, and so I'm kind of limited on what I can do as far as caring for students, um, but we do have great off-campus resources as well. When they come back um, to campus, we'll talk about that in just a minute, but that's where the connection between having a primary care provider and um, knowing the local health department is going to be important for our, for our students. Next slide. So we want to know, um, we want to have documentation from their primary care provider or from the local health department in order to come back to campus. I don't feel like it, I can say to someone, yes, you've been cleared and okay to come back to campus. So again, we have a really good working relationship with our local health department and a coordinated effort that they would be able to help us with that. And if students are going to get tested off campus, they should have a primary care provider there as well that could help help with that documentation. Currently, we're not asking for a negative test prior to them returning to campus. Um, that's not been something our local health department has been doing, but I do know that that could change as anything with COVID can. So right now we're not asking for an isolated or a negative test. So some of the other protective measures we're going to be doing um, is we're going to ask students to wear face coverings at all times, maintaining that six feet of physical distancing at all times, understanding that there are times when they're not going to be able to do that, but that's where the masks are really important. And so just emphasizing that to the students. Um, and then frequent hand hygiene, cough etiquette, you know, all of those kind of prevention practices. If students aren't wearing a mask, or are wearing masks, excuse me, and physical distancing, we may not have to quarantine all those students. It's going to be situational though, um, and through contact tracing, after identifying, you know, who they've been in contact with, and, you know, figuring out where masks being worn, it could be a, and make it that determination if every individual that they had contact with would be in quarantine. So really promoting wearing face coverings at all times. That will really help minimize the need for quarantine space. I'm using the, the close contact definition of six feet for 15 minutes or more is currently what we're using. We again have isolation in quarantine spaces, but if students would like to, they can return home, they can go off campus. Um, but again, we do have some, some places for them to be Due to our limited testing capability, right now we can only test those that are symptomatic 
and there are some guidelines that uh, our local hospital uses as far as who or what symptoms we can classify for testing, um, or if they're a known case of a positive, then we would look at testing. I really wouldn't test them right away. Um, about day five or six, we could encourage testing to see if those individuals are, are positive, um, but it's really going to be making sure those students get into quarantine right away to help you know, minimize that spread. So as students are in quarantine and isolation, as I said before, I'm kind of serving more in that care case management approach. And so we'll just be checking in on them, uh, making sure they're monitoring their, their symptoms, if they are having any, uh, taking temperatures. We will have some supplies in our quarantine and isolation spaces. If students don't have thermometers, we're encouraging them to bring those, but we, we will have some available to them. Um, we are doing telehealth appointments, so we'll be able to talk over the phone or do a telehealth appointment, but just making sure they have all of their, their needs met, food delivery, able to you know, go to class, um, just those things. So with our international students, we have our state's directed health measure right now is if anybody is traveling internationally, they must quarantine for 14 days. And so we're working on that process as what that's going to look like um, on campus versus off. Our campus space is really designed those for those that are on campus, but we're still working through some of that. Um, as I mentioned before, Test Nebraska is free. And so right now that's where we'll send students because it costs nothing. They don't bill insurance or anything like that. So um, Really, that's one of our best testing options at this moment in time. And so that will be a testing option for all students, whether they have insurance or not. So we're pretty fortunate to have that as a resource and only two blocks away. Communications, um, we're still kind of working through some of this, but all of our communications will go through our communication department. We are going to work on a script and an FAQ you know, so we can educate our campus, educate students and parents and community members. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of work on what do those FAQs look like. If there are specific questions, they will divert that information to the specific department so that we can handle that, that question specifically. Um, trying to take some things off of my plate, our student life's plate so that we're not having to answer a bunch of questions. But of course, no personal or identifiable information will be shared. We have a website like most colleges and universities do. So our reopening plans are currently on the website and we refer to that website often. That's where we post any updates or any changes. And again, that's accessible to anybody on campus. Athletics. Okay, this is an interesting one. I don't even have clear answers yet with athletics. Um, this is kind of an evolving situation for us. We are still waiting for our overall governing body to kind of give us, you know, clear expectations, but things that we are kind of expecting would be like daily temperatures for athletes um, and then uh, screenings, even though they're already screening for us, they have to screen before they go to practice potentially still working through what some of those testing options would be depending upon again what our our overall governing body says with um each situation it's going to be unique so again for me to have that good working relationship with our health department is going to be very important um, because each COVID-19 situation is going to be different so um having that good i just can't say that enough that having a good working relationship with your local health department will be, be really helpful. For me, um, as I said, I'm a, a one person show, uh, working on hiring an additional person just to kind of help take some of my, my load off. I am also overseeing our counseling office. So we have a full-time counselor, two part-time counselors. Those services are free to our students so they can see them you know, anytime if they have questions. Uh, we have a let's talk program uh, that's free, just, you know, brief consultations for students if they have any questions. 
Um, they will be doing telehealth appointments just like I will be doing telehealth appointments um, for the foreseeable future. We have masks and we have face shields. Um, I recently and just today got our air purifiers for our offices because we don't have great air exchange. You know, so we want to make sure we're trying to kind of filter and clean, clean those out. But we're we're working really hard to continue to provide the services we've always provided to our students, um, but also just realizing we need to be there and help and answer questions and support students at this time. So that is all I have from a small campus perspective. Thank you very much, Andrea. And I know uh, we are seeing a variety of questions in the question box and so but we're going to hold them to the end just so that we can uh, we have the full spectrum and then um, hopefully I'll have some dialogue among among you. So uh, Saranda, my pleasure to turn the dais over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Saranda Robinson, Chair of the Department of Public Health Education at North Carolina Central University. So just a brief overview of what I'll be discussing today. First, I'll tell you a little bit about who we are and COVID-19 in our community, and then share with you our guidelines for returning to the nest. We are the Eagles, and so our campus is referred to as the nest. I'll tell you about our COVID-19 practices and what we plan to do to mitigate exposure on campus, how we're communicating our plans and responding rapidly, and then additional resources will be shared that are available to our students and others may use as well. So a little bit about who we are. Um, North Carolina Central University is a public historically black university in Durham, North Carolina, and we were founded in 1909. Our student enrollment is approximately 8,000, typically just over 8,000 students. And we recently received a $1 million um, grant fund to address COVID-19 issues regarding economics and health disparities. You can see a little here about um, how COVID-19 is impacting our community. Um, North Carolina is one of the areas where um, rates tend to still be rising at times. Um, in Durham, we have had um, 73 deaths as of yesterday, which is about 163 per 10,000 residents. And we've had um, 5,169 cases again as of yesterday. So these are some of our guidelines for returning to the NIST. Um, we are following recommendations by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, as well as the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. We're also adhering to guidelines from our state and local government, as well as the federal government. We are a part of the UNC system. There are 17 institutions in our system, and we're following their guidance as well. Protecting the nest, those are guidelines that have been developed for safely returning to the university. These guidelines are available on our website. We also have NCCU's Operations Recovery and Continuity Plan. We have a number of task force that have been developed to address this issue. Um, this particular plan, as well as the NCCU Pandemic and Communicable Disease Emergency Re Response Plan, we're the, um, led by our environmental health and safety. And we also have this pandemic emergency response team. We also have a, um, emergency task force in our student health. And again, we are following guidelines of our local government as well. In terms of COVID-19 testing, we have on-campus access to testing available. We have been fortunate to be able to um, hire and fund third party con um, contractors who will do our testing and contact tracing. Our results are typically available within 48 hours. In terms of regular testing, we are testing symptomatic individuals, um, contacts and special populations such as athletics, um, students with high risk, those who have been identified by our student health center as needing to be tested and we will um, test those in the residence hall 
on a kind of rotating basis between halls. We won't test all students every day, but students from residence hall will be tested on a, a regular basis. There are isolation and quarantine rooms available for students on campus, and we're following the CDC guidelines for returning. Again, similarly, as Ms. Baker said, um, absent of fever for three days without medication, you know, 10 days from the onset of symptoms. For these students in um, quarantine and isolation, we will be doing regular mental health checks. They too have access to virtual telehealth sessions with our counselors as well as with our student health. They will be provided with thermometers and sanitation items for those rooms and meals will be delivered to them. To mitigate exposures on campus, there will be a daily health screener required for students as well as faculty and staff to assess their symptoms and their exposures. For international students returning to campus, they will be required to quarantine for 14 days and to pass the screener prior to coming to campus. We also have very strict regulations for moving in um, to the dormitory and visitation is limited there. Masks are required on campus and they are provided for those who need them. We have directional signage posted and um, particular entrances and exits identified for the movement of traffic. Sanitation stations are available with sanitary items as well as with masks. We have enhanced disinfecting protocols with both our housekeeping as well as the provision of disinfectant items for um, the faculty and the students between classes. We are identifying or marking areas that to let you know when they were last sanitized. And of course, if um, positives are identified in particular areas, then they will do a special um, sanitizing of those areas. We have restricted elevator use to enhance safety and our courses will be offered in a hybrid format. So there will be some face-to-face -face courses with um, limited use of the classroom. So we're not using any more than 40% capacity of our classrooms to allow for appropriate social distancing. We have some courses that will be offered in a hybrid format. And then about 55% um, of our courses will be offered in an online format. Our instructors have been undergoing certifications and workshops to ensure that everyone is prepared to be able to teach online. We also have um, backup protocols for face-to-face -face courses in case there is a need for them to become offered in a remote manner. Our Office of Student Accessibilities will assess the need for students who may need special accommodations and so our student our instructors are prepared to provide services or instruction to those students as needed and similarly for students who are in quarantine or isolation again with our classrooms we are utilizing limited capacity to allow for appropriate distancing we have designated seating and, and attendance will be taken to aid with the contact tracing process. So we will know who students were around in the classroom. In our office buildings, we are asking visitors to schedule visits to the offices. We will have staggered work schedules to um, limit the overlap between staff or to reduce crowding in offices. And we have designated building entrances. With our cafeteria, we have reduced capacity for dining and box meals are available and all meals will be served by, pro by the staff in the cafeteria versus students being able to self-serve in some areas as they have been before. And then of course, um, we have again, removed some of the seating to um, make provisions for appropriate spacing. Again, in our dormitories, we have restricted visitations and no gatherings except for those in a, what we consider a family unit within the dormitory. We have limited sharing of you know, common areas and bathrooms. 
and social distancing and PPEs are required. And the visitation, I say, is restricted. And so um, parents who may want to come and visit, they have special protocols that they have to follow. With campus activities, virtual activities are recommended. Our Student Government Association and our Student Activity Board, they are working hard for students to still be able to be engaged, but in a safe manner. And if there are gatherings, the attendance is controlled and they must follow your symptom monitoring, PPE, and distancing requirements for those activities. In terms of how this information is communicated, we have been holding a number of virtual town hall meetings for all stakeholders, faculty, staff, students, and parents to inform them of our procedures and guidelines and who they can contact if they have questions. We've held SOAR parent meetings. So SOAR, that's our program for students who are coming onto camp. So our Eagles who are you know, joining our university. We have a number of videos available. We have been utilizing social media, particularly to reach out to our students. Our um, student health is available for questions. We have been receiving emails from our chancellor on a regular basis with regular updates. We have an NCCU coronavirus website where all of the information is available, the various guidelines that we're following, updates and announcements are available there as well. We also receive campus service announcements through our human resources. We've been working with our faculty and staff senates to communicate with those groups. And our public health education students are engaged in activities to um, promote mask wearing and proper health behaviors um, with the students. In terms of um, rapid response, our pandemic emergency response plan, it is a living document. It is ever evolving as necessary. Um, we have again our operations recovery and continuity task force that meets on a regular basis to make um, necessary changes and to address issues as they evolve. Our pandemic emergency response team meets regularly as well as our student health task force that meets on a daily basis. Again, we do have um, testing of proprietary groups that results within 48 hours. And then we have real-time contact tracing because of having that third party um, available to do this. So these are some of our best practices. Thank you very much, Dr. Robinson. I think what we'll do is just move on to our next two presenters. I think it's really, I, I can see some, uh, some contrast between our, our first two presentations and um, the, obviously the number of students makes a, a huge difference in, uh, in those that are uh, gathered to uh, respond and the resources available, but I'm sure there'll be uh, uh, a number of other compare and contrast as we go forward. So, so let's move on to several or larger universities um, who are represented today by uh, Dr. Sandra Bulmer and Amy Thompson. First with Dr. Bulmer, she is a professor of public health and is Dean of the School of Health and Human Services at Southern Connecticut State University in New Haven, Connecticut. Prior to this position, she was a faculty member in Southern's Department of Public Health uh, starting in 1999 and as a full professor in 2009. She is a specialist in college student health issues and women's exercise and health and has been active in campus leadership activities, including a six-year term on the Faculty Senate, chairing the Honors Thesis Committee, and chairing the searches for the Vice President of Student Affairs and the Director of Intercollegiate Athletics. In addition, Dr. Bulma served as SOPI's president. So we're very pleased to have her with us today. Following Dr. Bulmer will be Dr. Amy Thompson, who is the Vice Provost of Academic Affairs and Professor of Public Health at the University of Toledo in Toledo, Ohio. Dr. Thompson is the former National President of Ada Sigma Gamma, so we had 
several uh, key people in agency endowment with us today. And she's completed two terms as the National Advocacy Trustee for SOFI. She's published over 75 peer reviewed journal articles and secured nearly $1.4 million in grant funding. Her work has been presented and published both nationally and internationally. And Dr. Thompson is currently leading the University of Toledo's COVID-19 operation team that's responsible for developing all campus plans and for returning to campus. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Sandra Bulmer. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's so nice to be here with you and with all of the esteemed presenters. I've already learned quite a bit just listening to our first two presenters, and I certainly hope I can offer something that's of value to you today. Um, I think it's worth noting, you can change the slide, that this happened very quickly. <laughs> On March 6th, uh, we were doing a groundbreaking ceremony for a new building that we're building on campus. And it was a big festive day. And, you know, we were, we were already had, had some experience with COVID-19, but it happened so quickly. Within four days of this ceremony, we were closing our campus uh, prior to the spring break starting. So what I just want to say to everyone who's on this call, because most of you I see are affiliated with the universities, um, don't be hard on yourself. This happened quickly. Give yourself a pat on the back. We have done an amazing job closing our campuses, getting our students through the spring semester, um, and doing all the preparations that are necessary for reopening and a safe way for our students, faculty, and staff. So, you know, it's been a difficult time, but we've done a lot in a very short time, and it was not anticipated. Next slide. Our university, uh, if you're not familiar with it, we're located in New Haven, Connecticut. It's a, a wonderful urban community setting. We have approximately 10,000 students, 8,000 of them undergraduate, and 3,000 living on campus in our residence halls. We're a very diverse campus, more diverse all the time. The last two years, our freshman class has been majority minority students, and it's um, just a vibrant, vibrant uh, campus environment. And we primarily um, educate students from Connecticut. Uh, our students are from our neighborhoods in Connecticut where we do so much of the work in health and human services. And they return to those settings as employees in doing uh, health careers. So we take very seriously our mission of caring for them as they get educated because they are gonna be our workforce here. New Haven is a vibrant community, about 130,000 residents. Um, it's one of three large, largest cities in, in the state. And it is a very diverse community. Um, we do have, uh, if you're not familiar with the state of Connecticut, we often talk about the two Connecticut's. We have some of the richest zip codes in the country, and we also have some of the poorest. And New Haven has many challenges related to poverty. And we're very um, excited that we have one of the CDC REACH grants to work in the New Haven neighborhoods. And over the course of time with COVID, we've pivoted greatly to try to address um, many of the, the disparate health issues in the way that COVID is impacting communities of color and our black and brown communities. Um, other thing I would say is that the College of Health and Human Services is one of four colleges here at Southern. And about a third of the student population is in our college. We're made up of public health, social work, nursing, communication disorders, exercise science, and recreation, tourism, and sport management. So it's a, it's a very um, interesting interprofessional college. Next slide. So we are uh, part of a system, uh, much like Saranda was talking about being part of the UNC system, we're part of the Connecticut State Colleges and Universities. And that presents some wonderful things, being part of a bigger system. We have access to a lot of wisdom, a lot of uh, brilliant people are, are in such a, a large entity. But we also have the challenges of being part of a system. Sometimes we're waiting for others to make decisions before we can act. Sometimes we don't get to act in the way we want to because there's many interests that have to be represented in the decision making. 
so that really is, uh, it's in the center of this list of entities, um, but it really is, that's our master. <laughs> Most of our planning is happening at that level. We, of course, are looking to federal guidelines, um, which we haven't, haven't gotten much from. Uh, we have been, of course, uh, looking at the CDC as a real important guide for us. And I don't want to be repetitive. So much of what Andrea and Saranda talked about are the same things that we're doing in terms of guidance. We really um, do all use the same resources to guide us with our planning. And at the State of Connecticut, our governor is obviously, um, you know, dictating a lot of what we do with the pace of our reopening plan. We have a higher education commission here that is a fabric that looks across UConn, the state system, which consists of 12 community colleges, four state universities, of which Southern is one, and the privates. They're sort of all governed, and that's the one place, the Higher Education Commission, where we all come together, and we've been doing a lot together. And then Southern specifically. It's important to know that Southern is a unionized campus. I think uh, all but 38 of us are in a union. Um, the shared governance units, our faculty senate, our administrative faculty senate, these are very um, important entities on our campus that we try to collaborate with um, on all of our planning. And then I think it's really important to call out the critical role our department chairs have on our campus. They have been trying to boots on the ground um, implement all of the things that we've had to do to try to safely reopen our campus. And that's everything from completely changing their schedules for the fall, a combination of online, hybrid, and on-ground learning, and address the concerns that their faculty, staff, and students have, very valid concerns. They are the front line, and they have been critical to the planning and will continue to be going forward. Next slide. I didn't put this up here with any intention you'd be able to read it. I put it up here more to illustrate the complexity of the plan that I have had to work on and all of our 12 community colleges and four state universities have had to submit. This was the guideline that was the framework that was given to us by our system office. And we had to address these 27 items with plans for each of them. This is divided into four categories. So the first category is the yellow, it's repopulating the campus. And each of those had to have a plan. And not to be repetitive, a lot of what Saranda just put in her slides are the exact same things we're doing. I'm on campus today. It's the first time I've been uh, back in a while in my office. And there's a flurry of activity here. People are installing plexiglass, pulling chairs out of rooms, putting signs on the door for the new capacity of those rooms. There's a lot of activity to ready the facility for the reopening. And we're doing many of the same things with the strategies to social distance. We're doing the same things with bathrooms and air dryers and um, sanitizing protocols. All of those things are things that we're adopting. And we've looked to important uh, places to guide us. The American College of Health Association, for example, has a wonderful knowledge center that, that you might want to look at if you're looking for some guidance. The uh, green is monitoring health. We had to really develop protocols for each thing that needs to be done to safely monitor the campus. I'll talk about some of those in just a moment. The blue is our case containment protocols. And finally, the red is our plan to shut down. We had to have a really specific protocol for, for shutting down. And I will be honest with you, we have not yet really been able to get good guidance about what should dictate a shutdown. That's been all over the place. So we're, we don't really have a firm plan for that yet. Go ahead and change to the next slide. So uh, this, these are some of the things that, that Sophie had asked me to address and that Andrea and Saranda addressed in their talk. 
What we're doing at Southern um, is, I say for now, because as of 4 p.m. on July 22nd, <laughs> this information is accurate, but it might not be at 5.30 when we stop uh, and complete our webinar today. It's, it's been changing that quickly. And Amy and I were, were chatting uh, a few minutes before the webinar started about we don't, neither of us think we've ever worked harder. <laughs> I think that this summer has challenged me in, in ways professionally that, that are, are notable. But so much of the work we're all doing now is invisible because we redo plans multiple times before they get implemented, if they even do get implemented. And I think it's important as leaders that we all recognize this is happening at every level. Our, um, everybody is working extremely hard, whether or not it's visible. And, and that can be stressful on organizations. So what are we doing at Southern? Uh, our testing right now, as of 4 p.m. today, uh, the plan is that we are testing our residential students only. And we are requiring them to present evidence of a negative test when they move in. That has to be within the last 14 days. When the protocols first came out for what we needed to do in higher ed in the state of Connecticut, they divided us into two categories. Initially, there were colleges that had residential students and those that didn't. Those that did not were treated as businesses. And those that did were told that we had to have a testing protocol for everyone as they entered the campus. I think a few weeks into that planning, it became clear that was untenable. And that's why we've seen a shift in um, fewer requirements. I saw in the chat as we were talking um, in the first two speakers that people were you know, questioning that as a strategy and how effective it would be. Very valid comment. Um, we, we aren't pretending that that's a perfect strategy. I think that in our case and in many, it's um, a cost issue, quite frankly, and an access to testing and an ability to get results in a timely manner that, that makes it um, impossible perhaps to do more than, than what, what is required of us. For contact tracing, oh, and for testing, um, we also are probably leaning more to the symptom um, monitoring for people being allowed to return because we've seen so much uh, challenge, our medical director, uh, people are testing positive for five, six weeks without symptoms and we're not sure that we're gonna be able to use a test as, as a criteria for reentry. So a lot of things still being figured out. Contact tracing. We had a phone call with all of the universities in the state of Connecticut, and there are many. <laughs> We're a higher ed industry here. And the Department of Public Health for the state of Connecticut provided us with some guidance just the other day. They are unable to do our contact tracing. It's gonna be on us. But they are sharing their um, software, their tracking systems, and we're going to use a lot of the same systems that they're using. Connecticut's an interesting state. I'm from California, where we do things regionally. Connecticut is a little more, um, there's 169 unique municipalities in this little state, and a lot of the towns have their own local health departments, and we tend to go it alone. So uh, the, each of our students are gonna be owned by their town, in terms of contact tracing, but we will be a second layer, if you will, where the university will contact trace our own community and we will be putting together a process by which we will do that. The plan right now, 4 p.m. July 22nd, is that we're gonna try to assemble a team of students from public health and social work who will be under the guidance of faculty preceptors and they will be our contact tracing team. We have a couple of concerns with putting a plan together and our, our primary concern is always about student safety and about really providing, uh, taking care of, of our compact with our students. And if our social work students and public health students commit to this as their internship, we want to make sure that we can follow through and give them the internship that they need for their academic program. 
So the way we're planning to assemble our contact tracing program is that this team, this interprofessional team, will do more than just contact tracing. Because if the university closes, there is no more contact tracing. They're going to do health promotion work to try to promote uh, all the prevention strategies that we're going to need to promote on campus. And they're also going to do some mental health work. These are master's social work students who can go in and work with, we're worried about the students if they're quarantined, their mental health, and they're going to be providing um, mental health first aid as well. Uh, isolation. We are in a situation where we are experiencing uh, a pretty big hit to our enrollment as a result of this. And uh, many students have not, um, who were accepted have not deposited yet. Um, many are waiting to see if we're gonna open for business and what that's gonna look like. And the Northeast in New England specifically, if you're not familiar, we, our demography is such that all of our enrollments have been decreasing over the last decade. And this is going to be a real hit to many campuses. Uh, so the upside is we have plenty of room for isolation. We're planning to bring at most 2,000 students to campus instead of three. And we will have plenty of um, capacity, it looks like, for residence halls that have been set aside for quarantine. And we are going to be providing all the services that um, were discussed by our previous speakers. We're going to be delivering meals and doing all of those things that need to be done for a appropriate quarantine. For communication, we are doing a lot of the same things that Saranda referred to. We have a, a very dynamic president, President Joe, who communicates and does town halls and communicates with our students, faculty, and staff. But I would be lying if I didn't say this has been a challenge at my level of leadership. We have a lot of misinformation or no information, and yet we need to continue to lead and provide people with what they need to feel good about their situation. So uh, communication is a challenge. We're doing all the same things every university is. We have a website that has a portal that provides information. And what I personally have found is one of the best ways for me when I'm doing my research to get ideas or is just go to universities' websites. Everybody's got a portal for COVID planning. Some of the best stuff you'll ever find is just in those websites. People are doing great things, really great things. And then our athletics just canceled the season the other day. So that problem went away for many of us. They are still gonna be practicing though. So we will have um, some protocols that we need to keep in place, but the actual competition season has been canceled for the fall season at Southern. I have one more slide. Um, I just wanted to briefly mention some leadership challenges because there's going to be a lot written about this time <laughs> after we're on the other side. And I have found, you know, the communication when information is unavailable or constantly changing has been one of the greatest leadership challenges I've had in my career. Uh, it, is, it is really difficult when information just is not available. And if you're part of a system, you've got to wait. You can't make it up. You can't go rogue. You've got to wait for the, the right levels to tell you whether you're going online or can go online and whether you're bringing students back to residence halls or not. And you've got your values and your ethical compass that you're also following at the same time and navigating all of that, um, operating within those parameters set by others, balancing those multiple priorities. And then you have to, at this level, think about forecasting long-term impacts so you can make better short-term decisions. And what I mean by that is, you know, we could not open the residence halls and there would be, maybe there wouldn't be a university. I was not clearly aware before this year just how dependent we are as a higher ed industry on housing and meal plans. <laughs> it's, it's a huge business that makes us more vulnerable than we should be at this time because our academic products are much more portable. We can do a lot of that work remote, but the hospitality part of our business is not as hardy in that way. So what happens if you don't take in a, a reasonably sized freshman class? That's a four or five year financial impact, right? Because 
there's there's going to be a big big cost down the road. So I, I'm going to close there, and and uh, I hope that was that was um, something in that of value to you. And I'll look forward to listening to our last speaker. Thank you very much, Sandy. I thought that was a very interesting uh, point that I think most of the um, the discussion I've seen so far is the impact of athletics or the lack thereof on um, on uh, university budgets and uh, not so much on the residents and housing and what that means and the, for the longer term impact. So it was a very interesting point that you brought up. So now let's go to one of our largest universities here, Dr. Amy Thompson, talking about uh, the plans at uh, maybe Midwest of the country in uh, Toledo, Ohio. Amy? Sure, thanks, Elaine. And if you could just advance, I think, two slides to, yep, next one, please. Thank you. So first of all, uh, you know, I want to thank all of the panelists because I think they've each provided a very unique perspective of what's going on on their campus. And I just want to make a general statement that if there was ever a time that you know, we need your leadership uh, in public health and on campus is right now. And it's really important for you to look across the landscape and, and see the planning and things that are happening on your campus. And if there's not a public health person involved in that, it's a great way to advocate for that, right? And so uh, making sure that that's being represented in our planning uh, of our campus reopening plans. This is a slide that depicts what's going on in Ohio right now. And in the beginning of the pandemic, we, we were doing very, very well. You might've heard of our kind of famous uh, director of public health, Amy Acton, if you're familiar with her, uh, a real rock star in, in public health and did a tremendous job in kind of mitigating our spread in Ohio. Uh, we are kind of coming back up, if you will, on our number of cases, our hospitalizations and, and total deaths. Uh, we have a unique system uh, in Ohio in that we have county risk level alerts. So you can see where I'm at in Lucas County, which is at the top of the state, is where the University of Toledo is located. And basically, uh, every county is kind of different indicators that we use to kind of look at of spread, hospitalizations, et cetera. And if we move to a level four, which is our highest rating, that the thought is that that's really kind of a stay at home order, uh, kind of shutting uh, everything down. But I think that's kind of an evolving discussion uh, with our governor and throughout the state. I will also tell you that just today, our governor uh, issued a uh, mask mandate now requiring masks in, in public places. So that just was uh, public today. Next slide, please. So if you've never heard about the University of Toledo, uh, it is a, a comprehensive urban university in Toledo, Ohio. Uh, we have approximately 20,000 students uh, with a, a great mix of diversity of, of black and brown students. Next slide. And as you kind of look across the, the landscape of what we've been doing uh, with campus planning, we have different groups that kind of have different purposes. We have an incident command structure that's associated uh, with really infection control and involves a lot of um, infectious disease doctors, uh, you know, professionals in, in healthcare. We do have a hospital that's attached to our university. So we have some expertise there. We have a pandemic operations planning team that I chair that really looks at across the university, everybody working together from athletics, student affairs, academic affairs, facilities, you, you kind of get the, the gist of it. So it's everybody kind of talking on a, a weekly basis on a regular meeting of what's going on. That group was also responsible for writing the university kind of shutting down plan and kind of the, the opening up plan. And we also have different unit subcommittees that meet to create their own unit plans like in academic affairs or student affairs, et cetera. And then on top of that, we have uh, what we call the Ohio IUC recovery planning group that um, is basically all the Ohio institutions, public institutions that come together and meet and share ideas and things we also collectively make recommendations. 
So one of the documents we did was we weighed in and created a document for our governor uh, that was recommendations of best practices for universities. We are doing that same process right now on what would be the criteria for us to look at if we had to kind of shut down universities based on the number of increase in COVID cases. Next slide. So challenges of pandemic planning. Well, what is our new normal, right? It feels kind of strange to walk onto campus wearing a mask. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of strange to look across campus and see, you know, seating removed or caution tape or plexiglass. We are unsure what it will look like with different types of, of possible waves of, of COVID-19. Um, also, testing availability becomes very, very challenging right now to, based on the region. Um, right now where we're at, we're seeing a lot of our test kits being re redirected to hot zones like Texas and Florida. So we're starting to have shortages in our state. Uh, there was a, a recent uh, newspaper article over the weekend that says in our community pop-up sites, some places are waiting three weeks to get a COVID test. And then on top of that, it could be seven days, seven to eight days before they get the results back. And then our contact tracing is also backed up with our health departments. And so you can see, I think some of the panelists mentioned at what point do you just say, you know, is that helpful, right? So we also have some uncertainties of the virus. You know, we're learning about this at, at a regular basis. I think I read an article earlier this week that talked about that 70% of COVID patients have lung scarring that occur with that. There's other COVID, comorbid conditions that we know can happen. So it's not just about death. It's about the fact that it can take a while to get over this and you can certainly have long-term health impacts from that as well. And, and being in charge of planning like this, making sure that our campus is safe for everybody to return and create some somewhat some reassurance in that. And I think as, as Dean Bulmer mentioned, there's a lot of economic realities to this. I mean, I, I, I can tell you being a public health person and serving as the, the kind of the planner in this role, I can sit back and, and create this beautiful plan, <laughs> but there has lots of economic realities. I can say, wow, really we should only have one person in a dorm. Well, probably, but what does that mean when you're taking it down from four people that would normally be in the dorm? What kind of economic losses and, and how do you balance that uh, and survive? And as Dean Bulmer was mentioning, with every choice you make, it affects things like parking, dining, you know, different types of, of, of costs uh, uh, that or revenue that's generated on a college campus. So um, in a lot of ways, our enrollments have been down at many Midwestern universities. And so we've already had some significant budget cuts. Many of us are facing furloughs. We've had to permanent furloughs, you know, let people go, layoffs. So this is kind of our reality that we have to watch every decision we do in terms of what are those economic realities. Next slide. So our recovery plan, and, and I, I smile when I say this because we thought we had come up with every single you know, possible scenario. And just today I walked down the hallway and said, we really need another scenario. <laughs> and, but ours is based on six possible scenarios that everything from you know, kind of being a, a predominantly uh, remote campus, if we had to pivot all the way to the pandemic is over and what does that look like? Um, so we have six different scenarios and it really, again, gets every unit saying, if you're in scenario one, what does that look like? Or if you're in scenario six, what does that look like? We did align our plan with any guidance we could from um, uh, President Trump, the governor, the Ohio Department of Health and the CDC. So this is kind of a graphic that, that uh, we created for our plan and just kind of talks about the framework that our recovery response is based on. Next slide. And what are some of our response plan considerations? Well, again, some of these things we've already talked about, having social distancing of six feet, uh, protective equipment, making sure that face coverings are available, and I'll talk about that. 
Um, also, research labs are a really important thing. I don't think anybody's really touched on that, but what does that look like in terms of mitigation of risk in the research labs? Uh, temperature monitoring and daily health assessments. I think we've talked about some apps that are out there to use. Um, testing, isolation, and contact tracing. We've chosen at the University of Toledo, not only for safety purposes, but for fiscal reasons, that we are not having business travel at all. So it doesn't look like I would be going to any conferences if they were face-to-face uh, -face anytime soon. And then also uh, hygiene and sanitation stations uh, throughout campus. We've put hand, wall hand sanitizers up, uh, et cetera. Next slide. So this just is, I think is important because who we test and how we test really matters. In our state, this is current guidance in terms of who priority testing is. So as you can see right now, down at the very bottom is asymptomatic individuals, which we know spread about 50% of the virus. So this is one of the caveats with this is, we will likely move very soon to symptomatic testing only is my guess right now we are doing symptomatic, uh, plus if there was close contact. Um, you know, part of this narrative of testing is also the window of when you may test positive. Our infection control folks have told us that, you know, if you think you go and get exposed and you go and test immediately, you're not gonna test positive for probably at least 72 hours. So some of this is, is kind of, you know, trying to look at what that window period of time is. So um, asymptomatic people are, are really not on our plan. Um, when we talk about our testing plan, we, that is evolving based on our testing availability. Um, so right now we're planning to try to test our residential students. Um, you know, but again, some of that is based on the availability. We may have to go to random testing. And um, you know, also we wanna make testing available for our faculty and our staff and our non-residential students. But again, what is the reality of that if, if they're asymptomatic? Next slide. So our scenario that we're following is kind of a, a in between our scenario three and four, and we're calling it mostly on campus. Um, roughly, we have about 60% of our classes that are straight up face-to-face. -face. We have another 32% that are uh, online and 8% are a hybrid. We've had to kind of do this mix based on the classroom sizes and what could fit in there. Obviously, if you know if you, you can only have 40 students in there, um, you know you have to figure out you've got a roster of 50. You have to figure out how to flex your classes. We did cap all of our classes at 50 students, so we do not have large. Um, classrooms and everything that we read said that that's a great number to actually help mitigate the risk. Um, when we look at returning to work, we think it's really uh, important to try to be flexible uh, with work assignments. So um, we do have accommodations that faculty can apply for in terms of teaching uh, remote or online. Uh, we also have some uh, capacity to work with uh, staff in remote work agreements. One of the things you're all gonna be faced with is our schools are going hybrid, the K-12. And so you've got a lot of people that are tied to the K-12 that, you know, they're going to have a hard time figuring out how to come to work. So you need to plan for that. Um, also, we talked about daily symptom assessments. We're, we're saying all meetings and gatherings should be held online whenever possible. Really saying with office hours, do it virtually. Faculty Senate meetings, do it virtually. We have a current governor's order that restricts our gatherings to 10 people or less right now. So while that doesn't apply to classrooms, you know, we're getting all kinds of, what well, can we have new student convocation? What well, can we have this white coat ceremony? And we've had to figure out how to do everything virtually because of that governor's order. And if that is removed, we will probably go with something like no gatherings larger than 50 because that's what we're using for our classroom sizes. Next slide. So um, again, looking at our different types of courses, face-to-face, um, -face, which is traditional, online, which is asynchronous. Uh, we also have remote, which is synchronous, and then our hybrid instruction. Because of the fact that at any given time, people might have to be quarantined or isolated, we're requiring all lectures to be recorded for students. 
Um, we are planning on researching uh, or upping our research labs to 100% uh, to get that going, but it's got all social distancing and lots of uh, protections in place at, for, for our labs. We have recently de-densified our residence halls from uh, all the way down to single and double occupancy. So that's our current plan. Next slide. We are recovering, uh, requiring face coverings when you're indoors, unless you're in your office. Uh, we are not requiring face coverings outside as long as you can social distance. So if you're in your office, you can have your mask off with the door closed any other time. Um, one thing that we've done I think is unique. We've gotten a lot of questions about what do you do if a student doesn't wear a mask. We basically are, we have exemptions and any exemption will be uh, move to online and that includes both faculty staff and students. So in theory, we really would not have students in our classroom uh, that would not have a mask. If they come to class without a mask, there's cards the faculty member would give to the student asking them to leave class and go get a mask. We're selling masks on campus. We also have some available through student affairs. If the student does not leave class, we feel it's a health and safety issue, and we will um, allow our faculty to cancel that class on the spot if that's necessary. And I say that because I think the universities are looking for guidance uh, on those types of things. Also, we are hiring our health department to, to basically employ our students to do contact tracing. I will tell you, there's lots of different advice out there with your legal team, use them. We were told we have a, our own testing lab, and so we were told we could not do our own contact tracing. We were told we had to go and employ through the health department to do our contact tracing. So I, we are arranging to uh, contract, hire five contact tracers uh, at 20 hours a week, and that's basically 100 hours. What we're being told, and I'm, I'm saying this to the group to be thinking about, I have no idea if that's going to be enough, because we're being told that before, maybe someone would have to do three or four hours of contact tracing. Now they might have 100 or 150 contacts that they have to trace. Cornell came out with a study saying the average college student has 500 contacts in a day. So I, I'm, I'm cautious to think that that would be anywhere near what we'll need. So we may have to quickly flex that to a higher number. We have a number of beds ready for isolation and quarantine. And I, again, I want to put this into perspective. We have 3,000 students living on our campus once they come back. If we test all of them and you use a 5% conservative, I think it's a conservative, positive rate, off the bat, that's 150 students that we will have to isolate. And so, you know, think about how that can kind of take up your initial um, space on campus. Next slide. Other just interesting COVID uh, procedures, there's lots of mixed messages out there on what is a COVID exposure. And I think that in a lot of ways, the language is kind of vague. So for example, we were told by our health department that even if you're wearing your mask, that really it depends on proximity and length of time of exposure. So there's lots of caveats to that. So if I go in with a mask and I have you know, COVID positive and I go into a Lane's office and I'm in there for five minutes, you know, that might not be considered to be an exposure because we're both wearing masks. Maybe I'm six feet away. It's a short period of time. However, we were told by our health department that if you have a student, even though everybody's wearing a mask, even though that you are six feet social distancing, if you are in a class for three hours, that that could still potentially be an exposure and that we could potentially have to isolate uh, our students and our faculty. So there's, there's no easy like this is, you know, necessarily an exposure. And so we're very mindful of that, that that could kind of sideline our faculty and take them out of classes. So that was the guidance that we received from our health department. So I encourage you, some of you, make sure that you have that understanding with your health department. The other thing is some universities have numbers of what you will cancel at. We know one peer institution where they said, if you have three cases, you're closing down. So you need to know, you need to know if they have that in mind, right? 
So um, I, I, don't, I, want, I want to allow some time for some questions here, but the other things I want to mention, be mindful of HIPAA and FERPA because those are things that we are struggling to navigate on campus with. It's not just who tests positive in your class, but to give the people who are also in that class's names to the health department, there's lots of things you have to kind of tweak through with that. We've created our own waiver that we've had to try to get developed for people to sign. Um, we've also developed a restart manual that's like a playbook, and that's been really helpful with everything in one place. One other thing that's unique about, I think, us is we develop a COVID advocate program where every single college has a point person. And I just did a training this morning with them and made sure that they know everything that they possibly can about COVID and resources, so like a navigator. That's gonna help, I think, kind of take care of a lot of the questions in the department or the various unit levels. So, next slide. So I, I wanna save time for questions. I think this is our new normal at the University of Toledo. Um, we'll be wearing masks and doing everything we can to keep our campus community safe. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, all four speakers, excellent presentations. It is pretty mind boggling to, to think that um, uh, the, the range of issues that you have to consider and, um, you know, the depth and, and I think as health educators at heart, we are um, really prepared, probably in the best preparation to not only be flexible, but think about the ecological, the broader uh, issues that we know are influencing health, not just, um, not just uh, the ex exposure to the actual um, disease. I would like to ask one question, and I, I don't know... Um, before we get into some of the others here. Um, none of you has talked a lot at all about uh, either fraternities or sororities on your campus. And I know uh, they sometimes go under different kinds of uh, regulations and uh, how that fits into your campus planning. We don't have fraternity or sorority houses that are formal in part of the campus. We do have fraternities and sororities that we will very likely use to engage in the health promotion activity. Um, that'll be an important part for us. Okay, next question. Uh, I actually thought about this in, uh, in, both, in, in all the scenarios and uh, in, in examples that were provided today. We are pretty much looking at your state impact and maybe your city impact, what those cases look like. Um, but yet, in case of Toledo, I know you're very close to Detroit, which is a very huge epicenter uh, of outbreak. So how have you thought or have, you, have some of your plans been thinking about, about you know, how you're coordinating with the contiguous states or areas that your students might be coming from, either as commuter students, uh, they may be going to, uh, to uh, on weekends or, or you know, uh, in downtimes to in those other cities and be exposed. So how, how have you addressed that, if at all? We are um, allowing our students who are from out of state to come early to campus to quarantine. Um, we don't have, uh, Connecticut's just asking you all to stay away, actually, because <laughs> we, we had our peak of, you know, we've had 50,000 cases and 4,400 deaths. And uh, we're now really at a, a good place for the moment. So that's our strategy is to try to, try to hunker down. But um, being the higher ed is one of our biggest industries. Once all these out-of-state students pile in in August, I'm I'm really wondering what's what's going to happen. We're not isolating any of our students coming in. We discussed that, but because o Ohio is becoming a hotbed, just like everybody else, everywhere else right now, so we, we we are not isolating anybody when they come to campus in terms of out-of-state or international. Yeah, we, this is Andrea, I hope everyone can hear me. I was having technical difficulties. Um, we are not doing any type of quarantining um, domestic travel. We follow our state directed health measures at this time. So um, unless the governor says we need to, we won't be doing any quarantine. Same situation with us. Thank you. 
Um, there's a, there, there are some concerns about students that are, are normally at high risk, um, some with allergies, some with um, you know, chronic conditions. So uh, how have your plans been adjusted to take into consideration those students? We, go ahead, I'm sorry. Those students are being referred to our student accessibility services and they will um, follow up on kind of an individual basis. They have guidelines based on the student situation. And once the student presents those situations, they will um, guide them in how they should proceed. We actually have, our chairs have constructed a, a delivery model for the fall that is 70% online. So we have plenty of opportunities for students who want to have their education online to, to do so. And that would be the strategy for those students. Our more challenging thing, quite frankly, is the students who want to move into the residence halls and beyond ground. We really don't have quite enough to satisfy them and their parents. And similarly, uh, so with the availability of remote learning, so that is available for the students. Mm -hmm. Elaine, can I add something? I'm seeing this in the chat, and I, it's really important. You know, you all have probably read in like the Chronicle and Inside Higher Ed places where faculty are really pushing back about reopening, and that's something we're dealing with on a daily basis. And for those of you that are saying you don't have faculty representation on your planning groups, that's a recipe for disaster. So I, I strongly encourage you, get your faculty senate president, get your student government person on there, because the things you're seeing, like from the university, one of the universities in Georgia, I think there was a petition of like 900 faculty that were pushing back because faculty had no input. So you need to make sure that there is faculty and staff and student representation on these planning teams. It's critical. What about parents? Is there any kind of a voice in terms of um, uh, their, their concerns, obviously? Because I, you know, just hearing from a number of my own colleagues who are thinking of, should I let my kids go back? What, you know, what do you, what do you think is the, my, the best? My greatest resource right now is watching the parent Facebook page. <laughs> I read it religiously and I have a good sense of the temperature and it's everything that, you know, you would think. Uh, there's there's a, a more angst than I was expecting about not providing enough on-ground stuff for their kids. Um, they maybe have had them home too long, I don't know. <laughs> they really want a robust campus experience. Um, and you know we're we're balancing that with safety, and we're erring on the side of safety. So there's not going to be a lot of things that that kids associate with being in college going on. It's going to be a very different college experience. You sit in a classroom, and there's 12 people instead of 40. They're all wearing masks. Um, it's just not going to be the college experience that that many people would hope it would be. But that's the reality. Yeah, we've been kind of like I shared, we share information on social media and on the website. And I mean, parents, students, um, they can contact any number of people on or at campus if they have specific questions. So we've gotten some, but not, not a lot. And it is going to be different this year. You know, it's but it's not hopefully going to be forever. So trying to tell people that, you know, be patient with this process and if we can do all these things, you know, hopefully we can get through this, so. Okay. Well, I, I have to close with one last question because I know that each of you have um, you've just been so generous with your time today. If uh, Sophie could advocate for what is it you would need um, in terms of further guidance for your campus planning, uh, for your preparation, uh, if we could advocate to whether it's CDC or other uh, maybe philanthropic resources that could be available, what would it be? Well, I wish we, I, I, and this is nothing against the CDC, I just wish we had some clearer guidelines that would help us all. I mean, I think that's really hard at, at not only our state level, but coming out of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. I mean, they're, they're not exactly 
you know, giving us a lot. When we try to go to advocate with our administration on things, you know, we really have to kind of rely on, you know, our own state stuff, which, you know, might not always be a best practice either, right? I think it's just advocating for higher ed funding. Um, and that's not just public. I interact weekly with the privates. They are very vulnerable right now. Many of them in New England were uh, teetering on the edge as it was. And in order to really make the right decision, the ethical decision, um, a little bit of uh, help backstopping and scaffolding some of the financial uh, consequences could go a long way, I think. Uh, people are making decisions based on finances, and that's not something I think many are proud of. Saranda and Andrea, would you like to also add your thoughts? Of course, financial support is always good, but also with the messaging, when we're dealing with college students, just their um, perceived susceptibility and actually getting the message to them, you know, how, how real this is, the steps they need to take, and just further supporting that. That's one of the things that our public health education students are working on. But I think the messaging and messenger, all of that is very important to really deliver these messages to students and to the community at large. Yeah, I echo all of the things that they said. I mean, it, it is always helpful to get clear guidelines and, and financial support. I mean, this is having a huge financial impact on all colleges and university campuses. Thank you very much. Um, I know we're just at the, we're, at, we're out of time today. Unfortunately, um, you know, I'm sure we could uh, continue this conversation and, and also be enlightened by many of the participants today who are dealing coming up with very innovative solutions. We've heard some of the, you know, some of those shared vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, you know, the way that we're using students in the process and building internships and innovative ways of uh, working around the system and public, you know, contracting with health departments when it's necessary um, to, to actually use your students and do the tracing. So I just wanted to remind you all about the ACHA webinar next week. Some of you may like to get more involved with that and participate, not only the, uh, the other considerations with regard to you know, physical distancing, perhaps next week we'll even have more guidance or changed guidance, who knows, that might impact that. And then also, the, I think we've heard a little bit about today the issues of mental health, um, not only for students, uh, but also certainly the, the faculty and staff that are, um, whose livelihood uh, depends on employment at the university and want to do um, the ethical and moral thing to not only give their students a good learning environment, but also protect their, uh, their health and safety. Um, last but not least, I'll talk about the Advocacy Summit coming up in the fall, October 13th and 14th. This too will be virtual for the first time, the Sophie Health Education Advocacy Summit. You can get more information about that on the website. And thank you today so much for our four excellent speakers, Andrea Baker from Concordia, Saranda Robinson from North Carolina Central, Sandra Bulmer from Southern Connecticut State, and Amy Thompson, University of Toledo. I know your, uh, your websites will be great resources for people after today uh, in this afternoon session. Thank you to everyone who took the time to participate and um, stay safe, stay healthy, um, and uh, stay resilient. So thank you very much. Thank you, Elaine.